Movies are allowed to be fun. They don't always have to be these serious things that show us the darkest depths of the human experience or express some thought-provoking commentary about the world or society. After all, movies are an art form that have the ability to create an opportunity for escapism in a way that few mediums can. This is why movies do so well during chaotic moments and economic downturns historically. In 1934, Will Hayes, head of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors Association, said that no medium has contributed more greatly than the film to the maintenance of the national morale during a period featured by revolution, riot, and political turmoil in other countries. An article in Digital History, which is published by the University of Houston entitled The Movies Meet the Great Depression, goes on to say that during the Great Depression, Hollywood played a valuable psychological and ideological role providing reassurance and hope to a demoralized nation. Even at the Depression's depths, 60 to 80 million Americans attended the movies each week, and in the face of doubt and despair, films helped sustain national morale. This is especially noteworthy when you consider that in 1935, right in the middle of the Great Depression, the U.S. population was only 127 million. This means that roughly half of all Americans went to the movies on a weekly basis. That says a lot. To further emphasize this point, let's take a look at what was termed the Great Recession, which was between December of 2007 and June of 2009. According to federalreservehistory.org, this economic downturn was the longest since World War II. Let's take a brief look at the highest grossing films in 2008. We had superhero movies making their first big marks in the modern era with The Dark Knight, Iron Man, and Hancock hit in the scene. We had fun animated films like Kung Fu Panda, Madagascar Escape to Africa, and WALL-E, and fantasy adventure films such as Twilight, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and the Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian. We also had what just might be the single greatest year in the history of comedy movies. Get Smart, Juno, Tropic Thunder, Step Brothers, You Don't Mess With the Zohan, Pineapple Express, Role Models, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Strange Wilderness, and the movie we're going to be talking about today, The Rocker. I say all this to say that movies are allowed to be fun. It's okay to shut your brain off for a little bit, smile, and enjoy something that's good. That doesn't mean there's nothing to be gained from viewing it though. The central theme of The Rocker is to not let yourself be held prisoner by your past, and it is expressed tastefully and diligently throughout the film, while also showcasing one hell of a lot of heart. The Rocker tells a tale of a drummer who gets kicked out of his hair metal band in the late 80s, right before their big break, so as to make room for a record executive's nephew to take his place. He spends the next 20 years miserable and refusing to let go of his resentment for his plight. After being fired from his job as a result of a co-worker forcing him to listen to his former band Vesuvius' new album and his inevitable freakout, he moves in with his sister and ends up having to fill in as a drummer for his teenage nephew's band. They keep playing and end up with a record deal and a tour, so suddenly in his 40s, he gets a chance to live the life he always wanted. The movie is full of talent as the cast is amazing. The star of the film is none other than Rain Wilson, and he does a great job as Robert Fishman, aka Fish, the full-of-life eccentric and wild drummer. His nephew, who plays keys in the band, is a young Josh Gad, with this being the first movie that I ever saw him in back in 2008. We also have a young Emma Stone, fresh off of super bad fame, but prior to Easy A. The broody emo singer of the band is played by a young singer-songwriter named Teddy Geiger. Outside of the main core, we have a great supporting actor group as well. Jane Lynch plays Fish's sister, and the great Jeff Garland plays her husband. The mother of the singer of the band is Christina Applegate, and the band's slimy piece of crap manager is played by Jason Sudeikis, with his old band consisting of Bradley Cooper, Will Arnett, and Fred Armisen. This is one of the fun elements of the film at play, is that while all these actors were working prior to this, nobody was a household name that would go on to be yet. The movie is simply fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and genuinely funny moments, mostly utilizing physical and borderline slapstick humor which has all but disappeared from comedy over the past 10 years or so. It doesn't try too hard, and it doesn't pander. It simply is what it is, and there's nothing wrong with that. My girlfriend and I watched it together recently, as I like to watch movies I'm going to review with her prior to writing these, as I'm always interested by the criticisms that she offers. She gave the movie a 7, saying that it was corny and like School of Rock with no Jack Black. Now, to be honest, this criticism is somewhat fair. The movie is kind of corny, and while Rain Wilson does a good job in the film, he is no Jack Black, nor is the director Richard Linklater. That being said, who is Jack Black other than Jack Black, and who is Richard Linklater other than Richard Linklater? Nobody. I don't think it's fair to hold to that standard, as it's impossible to hit. I also don't feel that the movie is really trying to be School of Rock in any way. Is it about an aging, rock-obsessed man who never made it that suddenly has a bit of an opportunity when he meets some talented kids? Yes. That's really where the similarities start and end, though, unless we decide that optimistic and borderline naivety-infused positivity is somehow a school of rock trope alone. 
I think the premise of this movie stands on its own as it gives us a look at an alternative history for some of the great what-ifs in music history, with the ultimate being Pete Best. I won't spend too much time on this, so don't worry, but I do think it's worth noting. For those unaware, Pete Best was the Beatles drummer until 1962 when he was replaced by Ringo Starr. 13 months later, the Beatles had their first hit in England, and four months after that, the Beatles were playing the Ed Sullivan Show and having young boomer girls scream their names and chase them around in what became known as Beatlemania. Pete Best was this close to being a part of that. Imagine being Pete Best. Pete never really recovered from this and spent years of his life post Beatles going around and giving lectures on how he was almost a Beatle. My father actually saw one of these at Western Illinois University in the 80s. Of course, Pete Best isn't the only musician to suffer such a fate. However, nobody is a better poster child for this particular plight than Pete. A couple of other people to suffer from what I am now going to term a Bessian burden would be when Blink-182 switched drummers between Dude Ranch and Enema of the State, and when Nirvana's original drummer left and was replaced by Dave Grohl right before they started making Nevermind. Ouch. While I don't believe either of these were actually kicked out, boy would that still suck. Now, no offense to Lake 182 or Nirvana, both of whom are bands I absolutely love, but they don't really handle the Beatles in terms of fame or legacy. Pete Best had it the worst, making his name almost iconically ironic in this context. One of the things I love most about the movie is that there's a moment in the film, in the first act, where after Fish has been fired from his job, he's sitting at a bus stop next to none other than Pete Best himself. I love that. It's very cool of me to be willing to make this cameo that most people would never even notice, and it's so sweet of the movie to go out of their way to cast him in this. Throughout the film, we see a central theme iterated over and over again, which is not to let yourself be held prisoner by your past. The movie does a good job of not beating you over the head with this, but it's still there if you are paying attention. It does a great job of expressing the sentiment, and I think it's a lesson that people should take to heart. This is something I personally struggled with for many years, as a year-long debacle of an off and on, hot and cold relationship with a girl that I thought to be the one when I was 21 hindered me for years as I played it over and over and over in my head, trying to figure out what I could have done differently and hoping that life would somehow lead us back into one another's arms at a different place in time. It was only after I accepted the reality that the past was gone and that there was nothing I could do about it other than learn from it that I was able to move forward. Thank God I eventually did that. I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't, and I am in a really good place because of it. If there is anything in your past that you cling to, take this as a sign that it might be time to let it go. It's not easy. What is far and away easier is clinging to it and forcing yourself to constantly go back into those feelings as if by doing so, you are somehow more connected to that person, place, time, or experience. It's not good though. In fact, if you're anything like I was, it is slowly but surely killing you. Do not be held captive by your past or a previous notion of how your future was to be. You are here now and that's a wonderful thing. Move forward. Back onto the topic of the rocker. I must acknowledge some of my potential biases towards the film. I must be honest with myself and say that it's entirely possible that I like the movie as much as I do as a result of when it came out. See, I was a 15 year old musician in 2008 and I can still remember what friends I saw the movie with I still remember the amp the guitar player slash lead singer played, a Fender Frontman 212R by the way, and I can still remember how cool I thought Emma Stone's character was. Having grown up with a Beatles obsessed father and the first concert I ever attended being a Beatles tribute band called 1964, I was aware of the Pete Best story from an early age, so I immediately saw the parallels between the rocker and reality. It's entirely possible that I just saw this movie at the perfect time of my life and that I was the perfect audience for the film. That being said, when I rewatched it the other day, I thoroughly enjoyed it all the same. And that is not always the case when I go to rewatch something I loved in high school. Sometimes, when you view something without the rose tinted glasses, you see the rose to be nothing more than a dandelion. This wasn't the case with this movie though. It was still fun, funny at times, and made me feel good viewing it. Plus, the music in it is genuinely good, to the point where at one point in high school, I had its soundtrack on my iPod. Yes. We had iPods back then. The Rocker was not a successful movie, and I think that's a shame. Per IMDb, the movie had a budget of $15 million and grossed only $8.8 .8 million worldwide. Realviews.net's James Berardinelli wrote in his review of the movie, what if they made a Jack Black movie and Jack Black didn't show up? That's sort of the feeling I get with The Rocker, although truth be told, Rain Wilson does an admirable black impersonation. This isn't shocking though, as movies like this are rarely admired by professional movie critics. I think it's a real shame the way this movie was underappreciated in its time and even to this day. As of the writing of this, the movie has a 6.2 on IMDb, a 40% on the tomato meter, and a 46% in audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. It's better than that. It really is. Watch or rewatch The Rocker, decide if I'm right, and go rate it on these sites. 
If that's the rating it deserves, then that's the rating it deserves. However, I truly don't think so. It's a solid 7, or as Anthony Fantana would say, a strong 7. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Have a great day, everyone.